How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. I've got an exciting announcement. We're launching a Patreon. For those that are not familiar with Patreon, it's a platform that allows creators like podcasters to offer their followers more content, experiences, and even some merch. In order to provide you what you want, please take 60 seconds to fill out our survey. Link is in the show notes and blog post for this episode, and honestly, it's all over our social media. By filling out the survey, not only are you influencing what benefits we're going to offer, but you're also going to be the first to know when we actually launch. I can't thank you all enough for your listenership over the years. It's such a privilege to be able to launch a Patreon to engage with you all more. Did you know you can learn the sex of your baby as early as seven weeks into pregnancy? Juno Diagnostics offers BIRCH, which is a non-invasive prenatal test that screens for Y chromosome material to predict the sex of your baby. Here's how it works. You get a kit delivered directly to your home. You follow the instructions to collect a couple drops of blood from a finger stick. Then you ship it back to Juno's CLIA laboratory for testing. Within just a few days, you'll receive the results of the sex of your baby. Learn more at junodx.com, where you can use the code DNA today for 10% off your purchase of Birch. Also, be sure to tune into our full episode interview with experts from Juno Diagnostics coming soon. Joining me now is Avni Santani, who is the chief medical officer at Veritas, which is a Let's Get Checked company, which delivers tailored at-home healthcare solutions to over 300 organizations. And I think, I don't know if I can say household name, but came up on the news. I'd be somewhere and I'd see Let's Get Checked, like pop up on CNN or something. So, um, you know, through COVID, I feel like has become uh, much more of a popular and, and growing company. Um, so... Um, Avni holds a master's degree in medical molecular genetics from the University of Aberdeen and a PhD in genetics from Texas A&M University. She holds a specialty board certifications in clinical molecular genetics and clinical cytogenetics from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOPT, as many people know. So welcome to so much. As I was reading this, I was like, wait a minute, cytogenetics? I don't find a lot of us out there. I got my undergrad in cytogenetics. <laughs> Oh, you did. I didn't find a lot of people who have an undergrad in cytogenetics. Good to meet you, Kira. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's wonderful to have you on. And, and we're going to be chatting about an emerging area of genetics, which I've been saying for a few years, but it's still very much relevant, pharmacogenomics. And so for the few people that maybe you're listening to this and need to be reminded, what is pharmacogenomics? And is it interchangeable with pharmacogenetics? Because I hear it used interchangeably, but I don't know if that's actually accurate. Yeah, so uh, pharmacogenetics is really the study of individual genetic variants and how we individually respond to certain medications. And as sequencing technologies and our ability to interrogate genomes using genotyping has evolved, I think we're just able to go beyond a single gene or a single variant. And so pharmacogenomics really allows us to look at genetic variation, of course, across the genome. Uh, so I do use them interchangeably, uh, especially in the realm of where we are at Let's Get Checked, which is using whole genome sequencing and really big data sets to help with prevention and treatment of disorders. So let's get into what the state of genetic testing is today in the pharmacogenomics space, because you know, we started the show 10 years ago, or I at the time, um, you know, started in 2012. And it was definitely a buzzword, I would say, either then or a couple of years later. Um, wh where are we today? Like when someone goes to order pharmacogenetic testing, I mean, how many conditions are we looking at? Like what's changed in the last few years or, or, or has it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of publications focused on not only our ability to interrogate the genome better, we've seen just uh, superior, and I've seen your podcast list as well, 
We've, there's just a lot of advancements in how we interrogate the genome, especially for single positions within the genome, and having it done in a cost-effective way. One of the biggest challenges for any genetic test has been cost accessibility, right? And so the more we do, in some cases, the cheaper it should get, but that's not always the case with genetic testing or sequencing. We are now at the stage after in the last decade where the cost of sequencing, both uh, doing the whole genome or genotyping has continues to drop quite a bit. Our ability to use informatics machine learning has increased and we just have a fabulous array of tools that allows us to take this data and digest it and actually give information back that's useful. So both with pharmacogenomics and genetic testing, I'd say, uh, there's increasing acceptance in the community in terms of the utility of this information, which is we need to get out of this trial and error prescribing model that really the whole world adheres to. Just as like no two individuals are the same, why do we accept the fact that all of us will process medication with the same dosage? It's just, it's just not feasible, right? And it's not acceptable that we accept side effects as a daily daily life occurrence. And so the use of pharmacogenomics and the reason there's so much excitement around it is it's a tool for providers, for prescriptions, for making sure that you can personalize medication to that patient based on their genetic makeup. It not only gets you out of this whole uh, trial and error uh, role, but it also just has a massive impact on quality of life. And later on, we'll talk about some specific patient stories that I've come across, but that's an N of one, each patient confiding in me how pharmacogenomics has helped this, but it adds up in terms of both outcomes, improved outcomes, as well as decreasing healthcare costs. So as the technology continues to evolve and we see these publications that come up with improved outcomes, decreased costs, the community in general, and I'm talking about the pharmacogenomics community, has done an amazing job of documenting this so that payers can tr start to accept this as evidence for both clinical validity and utility. So I'd say that's been the major improvement, just a great publications from several groups on um, the impact of genetics, pharmacogenetics in um, improving patient lives. And that more people are able to access this because it's gotten so much cheaper as you, as you said at the beginning of your response of like when this when genetic sequencing and testing was really expensive not a lot of people could afford to do it so not a lot of doctors are going to learn about this and like take the time to say well does this make sense for my patient but now that the cost has plummeted over the years especially the last 10 years i mean we see that now people can afford this because usually it's more in the hundreds it's not in the thousands anymore in terms of cost um, and, and one thing I was thinking about, like trial and error, as you were talking, is, you know, one of the areas I think about most with pharmacogenomics is in psychiatry, looking mm -hmm. at, you know, that trial and error, like to me and mental health, like uh, medications to support people with mental health conditions. That is like such a trial and error. And, and it takes months, if not years, sometimes to find meds that work. Um, I'll use myself as an example to, to put myself on stage. So I experience anxiety. And so after many years saw a psychiatrist. And so my mom's also a social worker. So I talked to her, well, is there certain drugs that I should say, well, maybe this would be better than another one. And, you know, depending on what other family members are used in my family. Um, and so it, it's, it's interesting because not only is my psychiatrist like, okay, figuring out which drug Lexapro ended up working great for me. I wish they could sponsor the show. Like, I mean, it's a generic drug now, but really it's, this show is brought to you by Lexapro, but also figuring out the dosage. So I started out on a lower dose than I am now. I'm on like 20 milligrams now. But had I had genetic, like genetic testing to say, well, this would be a better dose for you. This is, I happen to be, um, you know, taking advantage of the first drug I tried, um, which that could be taken out of context weirdly. But the first drug I was prescribed worked well for me, but I had sure. to up the dosage. So I yeah. imagine in a few years, if someone else in my family were going to do that, they would probably have... Pharmacono pharmacogenetic test say, well, these are the drugs that maybe we should try first instead of just, you know, grabbing mm -hmm. one that works for most people. Yeah. And that's really the, the promise of this is like, is there enough information here for preemptive PGX testing? So not waiting for 
the side effects to occur for drugs to fail, spending months trying to actually identify the right solution and then getting PGX testing. But preemptively, imagine if we could just have that in every person's EHR record. And this is a dream. It, there are like there are a number of really real and critical implementation challenges that prevent us from doing this, despite the cost of sequencing coming down. But that would be the holy grail here, which is we we all have our PGX test results in an EHR in a way that is easy to digest for clinicians because we all see multiple specialties as we get older. And it helps them make decisions related to how these results can be used for, say, for prescription. And since you um, thank you for sharing, actually, your your own experience with this. Since I started speaking about pharmacogenomics uh, publicly, I have had a number of people approach me uh, to share their stories. And this is a story from a close friend of mine who we are family uh, friends. We've been friends for about 10 years now. So she's given me permission to share her story. So she had a crippling combination of both anxiety as well as depression, which as we know are frequent comorbid conditions that can happen. And in behavioral health, Kira, as you pointed out, you end up sometimes having a cocktail of drugs, not just one medication, which then makes it really hard to actually tell when a medication is not proving effective or is causing side effects. And she went through a talk therapy and a psychiatrist and went through about 10 years of medication drug dosing changes. And it had a major negative effect, not only on her quality of life, but for her kids who were young at the time and her husband. And the side effects were not only not solving, obviously, her initial presenting symptoms of depression and anxiety, but the side effects made her bedridden. She couldn't get out of bed for months sometimes. And so we, uh, at some point, we sort of suggested that she take advantage of one of these pharmacogenomics tests. I won't mention the name of the company, but they ended up being very useful because the psychiatrist took about six months to dial her off her medication regimen and then put her back on medications that were actually going to have an impact on us. It's precisely the use of pharmacogenomics testing, right? And it took a year for that whole process because it, and I wasn't aware of this until I ended up being this involved in the field, how long it takes for you to cycle off the doses before you can add a new medication regimen. And it's, it's, um, it's frustrating because you can see your friend struggle through these symptoms and not have a way to move forward. After, she's much better now, greatly improved quality of life, is able to be present for her kids this is an N of one, but you do have to think about this across millions of patients who are taking medications right now. And she said, I just felt like I lost 10 years of my life. That Imagine I Imagine if I she had had this test 10 years ago. I mean, it yeah. would just be, I mean, obviously it's been life-changing as you've shared with yeah. her family, her kids. I mean, it like one year is, is not a long time in terms of finding the right medication. So like, that's great. And, and it's not like the test will tell you, oh, this specific drug and this specific dose. But from my understanding, and please correct me, it, it can tell you, well, these drugs are more likely to work and like, oh, you metabolize fast, you metabolize slow. And so that it's like a tool in figuring out what's going to work best. Am I getting that yeah, right? That, yeah, exactly. Well, so the test itself, because a genetic testing lab can't help with medical decision-making. So the test itself gives us information that healthcare providers can use as a tool to make dosing changes. But that's a critical component. We call that clinical decision support. And one of the reasons I'm really excited to be at Let's Get Checked is everybody from top down really pays a lot of attention to empathy and the member experience. And there's a great blog actually on our website about one of our UX designers who talks about designing with empathy. And uh, Tony, who held, heads over our sales teams, called me one day while we were designing the PGX product and said, well, Doc, what do we do with the genetic test result? How is a healthcare provider or a patient actually going to use this? And I said, yeah, if my daughter has ADHD and if she now needs to make medication changes with her uh, pediatrician, 
this information is overwhelming for somebody who is not used to genetics. And that's where a lot of implementation challenges in the past have occurred in PGX. So we focused on clinical decision support, which is giving access to reports, to information, to um, you, to basically programs that will help you put lifestyle information, medical history, the clinical history, all the other medications they're changing, they're taking, and then adding the genetic test component. It then gives you a report that says, well, based on this for Avni or Avni's daughter, here are all the major changes you have to make. That's a separate report than the test report, but it informs that report. We've then paired that with a pharmacogenomic specialist who's available to healthcare providers to now help them take this back and use this for the patient. And that was a crucial sort of gap in the product design when we were first starting to work with this. And uh, I credit the team, like they came together with, with a way to close the circle and bring it back to the patient and the clinic. That's fantastic. So it sounds like that person that's closing the circle sort of has like a medical science liaison role where they're helping the doctor, the healthcare provider that ordered the test, understand the results and apply it to that specific patient. Yeah. And a critical um, liaison here is a pharmacist who's trained in pharmacogenomics. And so the team at Let's Get Checked or anywhere else is, is crucial to have somebody who understands medications as well as the role of genomics in influencing this, because you do have to understand what the results, genetic test results mean for you in this context. And this has been one of the barriers is the, the stress of accepting genetic results, not knowing what genetics means. Like a lot of healthcare providers don't have the time to figure this out and we get that. And so how do we make this as easy as possible for them to accept this information and process it and use it right away. So they don't spend time like trying to figure this out. We are here to just help you. Yeah, that is incredibly helpful. That's like, and I imagine there's not a lot of people that have your type of education because you need to have a background in pharmacy and you need to have a background in genetics, or at least, you know, somehow be aware of these fields and how they're interplaying. I imagine your, your subfield is, is quite small because genetics is already small. So then you throw on having to be a pharmacist or no pharmacy on top of that. That's that's a small field. Yeah, so I, I call myself a genomicist because I basically do diagnostics, pediatrics, pharmacogenomics. I'm all over the place. Uh, but we do have a team of pharmacists who either have a master's degree in pharmacogenomics on top of their PharmD or are pharmacists who've taken training programs for pharmacogenomics. And uh, at the end of the day, you it, you know, it's it's kind of like I was telling you, Kira, like genetic counselors play such a critical role in the delivery of genetic test results back to the patient and the providers and making sure everybody, all the stakeholders who are involved in taking care of that patient really understand what this means for them. And I think pharmacists and pharmacogenomic specialists will play a similar role in this setting of pharmacogenomics. Do you see in the future genetic counselors starting to be more active in pharmacogenomics and having a role? I mean, obviously, you know, we don't have the background in pharmacy, but is that to a certain extent, could you learn that on the job or be trained where you see like genetic counselors being more active in this field and like neurogenetics, cardiogenetics, those have really exploded the last, yeah. I don't know, two to five years. Yeah. So I, I think there are two components uh, here where, so we have at least two touch points during the pharmacogenomics uh, product that we la launched. And at least for one of them, I think there's a very strong role for a genetic counselor to be involved, which is just the genetic test results coming out without the clinical decision support. And right away, instantly, like the patient and the healthcare provider might have a lot of questions just about like, what do all the symbols mean? Like if you're an outsider and this is how we approach every product is if you're looking at from what is star alleles, like what is low metabolizing standards, what does this symbol mean that shows ultra rapid to low, right? And so, and then there's a bunch of medications and you really have to get the concepts of like a pro drug versus, you know, low metabolizer status versus what this means. And the test result stays away from clinical dose recommendations. This is, it's just telling you what your genetic results mean for any kind of drug that's part of that panel. Um, and so I think genetic counselors are great with just walking 
the member through the description of like, what do these results really mean in general for you? And then when there are pharmaceutical changes to be made, that's when we bring in the pharmacist to really help, you know, drive it in. Interpreting versus prescribing, like two yes. different roles there. Yes, Interesting. exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Surely you've heard of whole genome sequencing, but what about rapid and ultra rapid whole genome sequencing? This is an emerging method of diagnosing genetic conditions for quick management. Perkinelmer Genomics offers this incredibly valuable test, which can be life-saving for ill babies and kids. Learn more in our full episode with Perkinelmer Genomics on here, DNA Today. You can visit perkinelmergenomics.com for more information. The link is also available in the show notes and on our website, dnatoday.com. Non-invasive prenatal testing screening has been around for a decade now, as long as DNA Today, actually, and the technology has evolved in those 10 years. The screening started to detect Down syndrome, and now Billion to One's Unity screen assesses for the chance for pregnancies to have aneuploidies, which are extra missing chromosome conditions, recessive conditions like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, and the presence of red blood cell fetal antigens. Billion to One named the screening Unity Screen as it brings together fetal screening for aneuploidies and recessive conditions. It also represents uniting pregnant patients in more equitable care. Unity does not require a blood sample from the other biological parent or sperm donor to assess fetal risk, enabling more pregnancies at risk to be affected with recessive conditions to be identified earlier in pregnancy as compared to traditional carrier screening. Billion to One is working towards one goal, to detect disease one molecule at a time. No early with one simple blood test. Visit unityscreen.com for more information. And be sure to check out our DNA Today episodes where Billion to One experts join me to explore non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions. That's episode 224. And red blood cell fetal antigens. That's episode 225. Juno Diagnostics has developed the next generation of non-invasive prenatal tests so that all pregnant people can access a higher standard of care. Juno Diagnostics is the only genetic testing company on the market that performs NIPs for common aneuploidies on blood samples from a finger stick instead of a traditional venous blood draw. That means you collect your sample on your own time at home and still have NIPs at a CLIA laboratory. Juno's hazel NIP screens for common chromosome variations seen in pregnancy, such as Down syndrome or trisomy 21, trisomy 13, and trisomy 18, in addition to testing for fetal sex. You can order this test yourself or have your healthcare provider order for you. Head over to junodx.com and use the code DNA today for 10% off. And keep your eye out for our full episode interview with experts from Juno Diagnostics, including fellow genetic counselor Katie Sagasser and Dr. Allison Rogers. In the meantime, check out junodx.com to learn more about Hazel and their other tests, Birch, which tests just for the sex of your baby. Again, that's junodx.com with code DNA today for 10% off. And, and so we've talked about a couple different areas now focusing on behavioral health is what a lot of our conversation has been about. And, you know, psychiatrists using this information, but there's other areas like diseases, conditions that also affect this because yeah. genetics is kind of the underlying of so much of biology, um, if not all of biology. So what other areas are commonly used or, or will be used in the near future in terms of like different conditions and diseases? Yeah. So again, like I think that I credit the community and I'm happy to share some publications after this, but uh, really the use of pharmacogenomics has been seen across all therapeutic areas. I'll highlight four of them. One is behavioral health, as we spoke of, oncology. There's a number of examples there in the space where we can like the DPYD test used for um, cancer is associated with such severe side effects, including morbidity, that it just doesn't make sense to me that we don't offer DPYD testing for all oncologists who are prescribing this medication. Um, then there is pain management, cardiovascular management, so a lot of chronic diseases. And our company works with uh, focuses on members, health plans, and employers. And so we're really thinking of like genetics at scale, but also making sure that we are providing the type of value that the healthcare system is really looking for here. And so when we designed the panel, we didn't focus on just one or two indications. We went with like real world utility. And so the test covers, I think about 800 million prescriptions 
It's across multiple therapeutic areas. It's cardio, pain, immunology, um, behavioral health, of course. Um, and then outside our test, in general, just PGX is applicable across, I would say, every therapeutic area that you can think of. Yeah. And same thing for practice settings too. Like we've seen it being implemented in pharmacies, community settings, hospitals, healthcare systems, payers. Um, and so it's been really great in the last decade to just see the increasing adoption of PGX across these various settings. And as you mentioned, like, you know, say I were to do this now and I share that with my psychiatrist, my GI doctor, like all different doctors, you know, I'm, I'm 27 now. I could use this for decades and decades down the line when I'm, you know, older and having joint pain and different things. I could bring this with me and be like, well, th this is what my genetics say in terms of like, will this help you prescribe the right medication? So I think it's just so useful throughout someone's life. And there's, there's not a lot of genetic tests that I can think of that really affect you throughout your life. Like when we look at cancer, like usually that's older ages or mm -hmm. pediatric, oh, you have a condition and we've diagnosed you now, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a different area of genetics when you think about it that way. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And it's not a lot, actually, it's one of the, um, one of the main reasons like that David, Dr. David Kaiser and I, we work closely together on the pharmacogenomics uh, area and he is very active in CPIC. He teaches the pharmacogenomics program in one of the universities. And um, he is a strong proponent of this, which is almost having like a card with your driver's license in your wallet that just has all the major medications that you want somebody to avoid. And uh, it's, act it's a great idea. Now we have to think of a digital way to do this where it's actually integrated in your healthcare system, obviously. But it's a, it's a great way to think about the use of PGX all the way, like you said, Kira, from the newborn stage to as you get older, polypharmacy, it's a big deal. Like there are millions of people who are taking multiple drugs and the more drugs you take, of course, the risk of side effects and ADRs just starts to increase. I mean, before I entered um, this space, I started just looking at numbers and impact and I was just shocked by all the statistics and I was like, why isn't pharmacogenetic genetics accepted everywhere? But like 80% of all treatments include medications. 50% of all medications are not, their patients are not adhering to their treatments. And so to me, that is such a great area to like target for improvement. And PGX alone doesn't solve it, but it definitely helps with it because when medications are effective, you're likely to be more likely to stay along with your medication, which is one of the biggest barriers for chronic conditions and managing chronic conditions is medication non-adherence, right? Uh, but some of these stats are just mind blowing that adverse drug reaction and side effects end up um, costing our healthcare system over $520 billion. Billion would and, be, I mean, that's just, it's, it's insanity. It's just, like when mm -hmm. we have not a simple fix, but we have a tool that would, greatly reduce that, not even just fiscally looking at it that way, but just human pain and suffering. I mean, you know, you shared your friend's story of going 10 years with not being on the right medications. And it's like th a lot of this can be prevented. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up, because you mentioned pain management, that the opioid epidemic is horrific. I mean, it's, it's terrible and it's still happening. And I would imagine this information could help prescribing doctors say, okay, well, this medication will work better than this, this dosage. So they're not giving too high doses to people that don't need it. I mean, we need more tools to fight the opioid epidemic because it's this situation where opioids are great. Like they, they really, they work well and that's why we prescribe them. But it's also the issue is because they're so highly addictive. I mean, when I had my wisdom teeth surgery, they gave me way more than I needed to. I didn't end up using them. Um, and, you know, I would cut pills in half and stuff. And I'm very aware of this. Yeah. But I would think like, you know, we are going through this epidemic. How, how are we not using every tool at our disposal? Well, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very complex answer to a very complex problem. And 
the opioid epidemic could be a topic of like five podcasts in itself. Oh, definitely. I feel like we should do a series on this show or something. Absolutely. And there are some great, actually, uh, documentaries on this subject as well. And it's it's linked to not just genetic variants, but obviously the monetary um, leverage that was there for pharmaceutical companies to keep pushing those yep, the medications. The Sackler family, yeah. Being aware of how highly addictive it is. So I, I don't know if pharmacogenomics would have had as much an impact there as much as, you know, just deceptive marketing practices that took place back then and now. I agree with you when I'm ever prescribed, like when I gave birth to my second child, um, they they gave me some opioids. I just refused to take them because I'm so nervous about, about any of the addictive behaviors there. But just connected to pain management, like a really great example is uh, codeine and uh, the use of the analgesic codeine to convert into morphine. So that's a, codeine is a prodrug and there are genetic variants that influence how we process and metabolize codeine. And so any any um, individual that can ultra rapidly metabolize the drug is at risk of severe toxicity and fatal outcomes, especially if they are younger or in the pediatric range. And there have been a number of great publications about this, but anybody who's an ultra rapid metabolizer should not get the standard dosage of uh, codeine. And so there are there are a number of, there's an N of one example that speaks to me personally, because when she, when my friend told me she doesn't remember photographs and doesn't remember her last 10 years of life, that says something to me. Now you multiply that by millions of people who are going through some sort of an experience that mimics basically a poor quality of life. And we say, why isn't this being paid for? And it's simple. It's, we need a lot of evidence to show that pharmacogenomics to payers, that pharmacogenomics will improve outcomes in certain settings and it will help decrease costs. And the more we strategically keep doing that, the higher the chances are that we will have a positive coverage determination. And so behavioral health has a recent great win, but it is now uh, paid by payers. And I think we have to just take each one of these settings and, and talk more to payers about really just documenting the evidence behind the validity and utility of these findings and also designing great studies like there's been a study that i'm happy to talk about it i'm sure you'll have a question on this but there's a great study that just came out about uh, use of pharmacogenomics and reducing adverse drug reactions we just need to publish and keep talking to payers about it yeah yeah well definitely everything that we're mentioning will link in the show notes um so swipe right or left depending on what uh, podcast app you're using Genetic technology moves fast. The first genome took 13 years to finish a draft. For reference, this was 20 years ago in 2003. And now a whole genome sequence can be performed in days, even hours. Since sequencing an entire genome can be done in such a short amount of time, this lowers the cost, which means more people can utilize whole genome sequencing now. This is particularly helpful in the NICU for ill infants. Perkinelmer Genomics explained more to me in our full episode here on DNA Today. It is remarkable how quick diagnosis from whole genome sequencing can save a baby's life with a change in treatment informed from the results of that test. I learned more about how genome data is mined to maximize useful information from one data set and other omic assays that help enhance diagnosis. Don't miss the full episode here on DNA Today. You can visit perkinelmergenomics.com for more information. The link is also available in the show notes and on our website, dnatoday.com. As a listener of DNA Today, you've probably heard me talk about NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing that looks for extra or missing chromosome conditions during pregnancy. But did you know there's also a test that can screen for recessive disorders like cystic fibrosis and fetal antigens? Billion to One offers Unity Screen, which does all of this from one blood draw from a pregnant person. Visit unityscreen.com for more information and check out our DNA Today episodes where Billion to One experts joined me to explore non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions. That was episode 224. And red blood cell fetal antigens. That was episode 225. But yeah, I mean, I think all of this is just so important and I realize I'm kind of running out of time. And, and I, I did want to ask you before we wrapped, um, how 
pharmacogenomics can impact the rare disease community. I mean, this is a community that's very close to my heart. We talk about rare diseases in so many episodes of DNA Today. Um, is there anything that you wanted to share just in terms of affecting the rare disease community, either with diagnosis, treatment? Uh, sure. I mean, genetics in general or pharmacogenomics? I mean, I have oh, for pharmacogenomics. Of- yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's a big question then. Uh, yeah, in terms of how pharmacogenomics um, is, is impacting now or you see it impacting um, the rare disease community in the near future? Well, so I think... Um, there have been a number of great examples where we're beginning to target therapy, knowing what the genetic variants are. Of course, treatment of SMA has been a big driver for that. I would say it's a fatal disease and there's a turnaround time in terms of how rapidly we can get both the genetic test results. And then uh, there are many directed clinical trials and studies going on for individual rare diseases where this can make an impact. I'd say genomics in general has been instrumental in bringing forward the problems associated with rare disease. So I was at CHOP for about 15 years. So I focused, my entire being was focused on using exomes and genomes for the diagnosis of rare disease, which ultimately leads to management. And there's a great case where we had a family from Kuwait who had um, a strong history of consanguinity and the syndrome was so rare that it has never been published or seen before. The child was in the hospital for two years in a coma. And um, we ended up identifying a novel gene through exome genome sequencing, and then were able to obtain uh, basically emergency approval from the FDA to use a medication that was approved for another indication, but was going to help this particular child. While we were doing this and we were trying to get to this answer as soon as possible, mom became pregnant. And so we were able to then use genetic sequencing and do like a five day turnaround time on just getting her sample from Kuwait, getting it sequenced and find out whether the baby is a carrier or not and start using those therapies then on her. Eventually multiple family members in the whole extended family ended up coming to CHOP for either diagnosis or treatment. And so you can see like the impact of this is sometimes, um, on one patient, and that's the only patient where this rare disease has been seen, or it's in a group of patients like cystic fibrosis, like SMA, where we see recurrent mutations, and then you can have pharma basically partner with you and help you drive therapeutics in that direction. Yeah. Um, wow. What a, what a story. I mean, that that is remarkable just to be able to figure out the novel gene and test during pregnancy. I mean, that that is really amazing because sometimes we struggle doing that even when a gene's been identified to see like, well, is that something we could test during pregnancy and just so many different obstacles there, but it's so great that they were able to see you at CHOP because also finding someone that uh, specializes in pediatric genetics is also challenging. Um, challenging. So yeah, 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 it's, that's really interesting. Cause there, um, I also produce another podcast called the patient engagement program. And um, that's by the N Lorem foundation in California mm-hmm. and they focus on N of one, um, you know, developing ASOs and, and different types of treatments there. So it's, it's something that I'm hearing more and more about, um, you know, just with guests that come on and, and everything, but, you know, I wish we had more time to talk about things. Cause man, this could be like a three hour episode. I feel like, yes, thank you so much for coming on Dr. Santini for just sharing so much of your wealth of knowledge. Um, about PGX and just, you know, all the different areas where we can use it. I think you've really shown that sky's the limit with this. And and I just can't wait to see the next five, 10 years, how we're using this just with the explosion of the field. So thank you so much for coming on. I'm super excited about it myself. Thank you, Kira, for having me. Talk to you soon. Bye. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. 
Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made.